Let's talk about the mycobacteria. Mycobacterium is the name of the genus. There are many different species, most of which just live uh, on the leaves of plants, actually, and don't cause any disease. But there are four species that seem to be important in disease. M. tuberculosis, as you're familiar with, is the causative agent of TB, or tuberculosis. We're going to talk about that in a little more detail in a minute. M. leprae causes leprosy. M. avium comes from the word bird. Uh, it's a causative agent of a TB-like disease that we see most often in AIDS patients. And M. bovis, bovis coming from bovine, is the causative agent of cow tuberculosis, bovine tuberculosis. And every now and then, rarely, we'll see it show up in the human population. M. bovis is what's used to develop the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis vaccine that we do not give here in the United States, but other parts of the world do have, uh, have these vaccines. So lots and lots of species, four in particular that seem to cause disease. Let's focus in on M. tuberculosis though. <clears throat> it has a strange cell wall. This is a, a very odd organism in general. Okay, if you look at its DNA, all its DNA points to it being a gram positive, but its cell wall doesn't really look gram positive. It doesn't stain very well uh, with anything, simple stains or gram stains. Uh, and so it was in, uh, an acid fast stain was invented for it, where a, a dye could get past this waxy outer coating of mycolic acids, and the, the wax would then trap the dye inside the cell, even when you tried to decolorize using a mix of acid and alcohol. And from all other species of bacteria, that would decolorize them. So mycobacteria, and then eventually we discovered that nocardia, another pathogen, uh, has these mycolic acids on the surface and would be considered technically acid fast. But you wouldn't find nocardia in the lungs in a sputum sample. So acid fast staining, particularly important when we suspect tuberculosis and we have a sputum sample so we can look for these acid fast uh, long bacilli. Let's talk real quick about that cell wall. It's, like I said, it's genetically gram positive. Um, you've got a, a plasma membrane, and then you've got some peptidoglycan, but not much, and then you've got this mycolic acid, and that's about it. So it, in, it really doesn't look like a gram-negative or a gram-positive. Uh, it's quite unusual in that way. <clears throat> what are the virulence factors? What are the molecules that mycobacterium tuberculosis can use to cause disease? Well, it really only comes down to two things, and they're both lipids. The mycolic acids that we've talked about, which are waxy lipids that coat the exterior of the cell. So imagine taking a bacterium and coating it in something like candle wax. It's essentially what we've done. It slows the growth because they can't get nutrients in very quickly. They can't get wastes out very quickly. And when growth is slow, antibiotics aren't very effective. Antibiotics typically require the bacteria to be growing pretty rapidly because it's during growth that they expose these vulnerable, vulnerable um, systems that the antibiotic can act against. And so mycolic acid makes antibiotics quite ineffective due to slow growth, but also it's hard for those antibiotics to diffuse across the waxy layer. So antibiotics aren't particularly useful. We do have a few we can use, but most of them aren't effective against tuberculosis. That waxy coating also uh, inhibits phagocytosis and digestion by phagocytes, very similar to a capsule in that way, except capsules aren't lipids, they're not waxy, they're typically carbohydrates, sometimes a little protein, but it has a similar um, effect on phagocytosis and, and sort of blocking the immune system from spotting them. <clears throat> what The mycolic acid, the purpose of the mycolic acid, most likely out in nature, remember I said most of these mycobacterium species live on the surfaces of plants? Well, they're exposed to all the sunlight and dryness. And you look at the surface of plants, and they tend to have waxes to keep them from drying out or desiccating. And the same is believed to be true of the various mycobacterium species that have these mycolic acids. It, it makes them resistant to drying out. One of the things that means, though, for the pathogen strains like TB is that the, the bacteria outside of a host can survive for a long, long time. Whereas something vulnerable like E. coli or even a gram-positive, typical gram-positive like maybe Staphylococcus might survive a few hours to a day on a door handle or a pillow, mycobacteria have been known to stick around for up to eight or nine months in a patient's room or a, um, a, an infected person's home. 
uh, just because of these waxes. <clears throat> now the other virulence factors are also lipids. They're called cord, cord factor. Cord factor inhibits another portion of the immune system called neutrophils. We'll talk about those later in the semester. And cord factor itself is directly toxic to us. In, in some ways, it's similar to the lipid A that we see in gram negatives, uh, where it's a, a lipid that has a, a toxicity against the host. Other than that, it really has no other virulence factors. It really relies heavily on these two surface, uh, these two surface lipids. It's transmitted by droplets, so speaking, coughing, sneezing, that kind of thing. As far as we know, <clears throat> it's taken up by the macrophages that surround and protect the alveoli of the lungs. So someone inhales a droplet, and the bacteria, the mycobacterium, attempts to cross the uh, alveolar uh, wall and get into the bloodstream, and it encounters a macrophage, a white blood cell there to protect the body. The, the macrophage takes it up, but then the mycobacteria has ways to save itself. Okay, Once it gets taken up, it secretes a molecule that doesn't allow it to be digested. Uh, it's called the phagolysosome, and that, that's the structure that digests it. We'll talk more about phagolysosome and blocking phagolysosome fusion at the end of the semester when we talk about the immune system. But for now, understand that the white blood cell whose job it is is to, to eat and digest these pathogens takes a big bite but then can't digest it. And so they stick around for a long time and they can eventually kill the host and even grow and divide within it. Or they can just stay there unhindered, unseen by the immune system and just kind of hide out inside your cells. Because it's hidden inside your cells, the various immune components, whether it's things like antibodies or complement or white blood cells, they're going to be ineffective because they're, they're hiding. They can't be seen. <clears throat> And then it forms a protective granuloma to sustain a long-term infection. That's what we call the tubercles, these little nodules that can be seen in a chest x-ray that uh, contain lots of white blood cells, usually surrounding a, uh, an, alve uh, an alveolus of the lungs. Um, lots of white blood cells, all containing lots of M tuberculosis within them. But then your immune system and the bacteria come to sort of a standoff. The bacteria can't grow anymore at some point, and if they ever burst out, the immune system can at least attempt to see them and begin to clear them. So they stay hidden often for long periods of time. Primary tuberculosis is when those alveolar macrophages are first infected, and they form the tubercles in the lungs. You can see this sequence of pictures. If we suspect someone may have TB or has been exposed to TB, we're going to do the tuberculin skin test. And you can see this little uh, nodule that shows up when we put some, uh, some M tuberculosis antigen under the skin. If there are antibodies against it, meaning that you've been exposed, they swell that region and give you this little, little red bump. Uh, that's step one. If you're positive from the tuberculin skin test, then they'll do a chest x-ray and look for, for tubercles. You can see them in the picture, these white nodules in the lungs. <clears throat> if they find them, that indicates that you have at some point had primary tuberculosis. The last step is to find out whether it is latent, meaning it's not doing anything, or it's active, and we need to look at the sputum. So the picture on the right is a, uh, a, a deep um, a lung sputum sample. Basically, somebody just hawks a big loogie, and they hand it off to some poor lab tech who has to do the acid-fast stain on here, and they look for these red acid-fast bacilli in the sputum. If they find that, that confirms that the patient has active primary tuberculosis. This is most common in kids. Uh, most people, if they're going to be exposed or if they're vulnerable uh, to the active disease, it's going to be when they're, when they're much younger. The infectious dose is only 10 cells in respiratory droplets. 10 cells. It doesn't take much to establish at least an initial infection. If it goes untreated, mortality is about 50%, uh, considerably less if it's treated. But the disease rate, in other words, the number of people who get, who are positive for M tuberculosis, who actually get sick, is only about 5%. 95% of the people who are exposed to it at some point or other carry it around without active disease. There's a stalemate between the bacteria and your immune system. Your immune system says you're not budging. The bacteria say you can't kill us off completely, but they can't spread and cause disease. <clears throat> the bacilli can remain viable in dried respiratory droplets many months. I mentioned that those tubercles can remain dormant for decades. Uh, 
maybe you were a missionary kid in Africa and you had TB or you were exposed to TB when you were six, you may, those, those tubercles may remain dormant until you're 86. And all of a sudden you're in a weakened state and they burst out and they cause TB and it's all bad news. Now we talked about primary TB. Latent TB is those other 95%. Right? You got 5% of, of those who, who are exposed are, are sick. The other 95% are carriers and we call them latent or we say that their TB is latent. Not only are they not sick, they're not contagious because the bacteria are hiding out in the tubercles and they're not being released through the respiratory droplets. The only people that are actually contagious are the ones with active tuberculosis, that 5%. Can reactivate when the defenses are down. That can be a, a physical trauma like a car accident. It can be um, immunosuppressive drugs to treat cancer. Or it can simply be something like old age as the immune system begins to weaken. Many people are carriers their whole lives and never have active tuberculosis. So it's, it's possible to live with this thing and never actually be sick. Now look at these last two statistics at the bottom. The World Health Organization estimates that over 2 billion people are TB positive. That's about a third of the world. About a third of planet Earth is TB positive. That's pretty incredible. Now remember, only 5% of those have active tuberculosis. But it's believed that this is the number one killer by pathogen in the history of man. <clears throat> world Health also estimates 30,000 people each year are infected, newly infected, with drug-resistant strains. And the terminology we use is MDR and XDR. MDR-TB means it's multi-drug resistant, and so the drugs we want to use, we can't use. XDR is a step up from there, extensively drug resistant. Fortunately, we've seen very few of those, but the XDR-TB cases are almost untreatable. People with TB uh, are often asked to... Um, asked to self-quarantine, but once we hit the MDR and XDR level, depending on the country you're in, there may be a mandatory, um, a mandatory quarantine to keep them from infecting other people. Now, reactivated tuberculosis, this can be scary. Let's say that, you know, 40 years later, these tubercle rep tubercles rupture and the bacteria are released and attempt to actually make you sick and reestablish an active infection, usually some kind of weakened immunity uh, is is when we see this happening, and very frequently we we see it being being spread or reactivated in big cities more than anywhere else. And then finally, disseminated TB. Fortunately, this is extremely uncommon in in modern times. This used to be called consumption, or miliary TB, or extra pulmonary TB. The idea is that a, one or more tubercles ruptures, and the microbes get into the bloodstream and spread, almost like almost like a tumor metastasizing, a cancerous tumor metastasizing, and in establishing cancer in other regions of the body. The TB can do that. It can get into places like the bone marrow, the spleen, the kidneys, the liver, the central nervous system. This occurs in, in a, a very small percentage of active TB cases, and it's very difficult to treat and has a very high mortality rate associated with it. You want to make a big difference in the world, go into tuberculosis work because uh, so much of the world is positive for it and we, we really are at a loss in terms of how to control it, especially these MDR and XDR strains.